This call is being recorded. Good morning. Can everybody hear me? Yes, I can hear you, yeah. Oh, good, Susie. I was wondering, I said, my phone is acting kind of crazy this morning. But good morning, good morning. How are you? I'm doing okay. How about you? I'm hanging in there, hanging in there. I got a little cold, but I'm okay. Good to hear your voice. You too, sweetie. Yeah. We got to take a trip somewhere. <laughs> Oh, no, it's starting to get warm out here. It was 90 degrees yesterday, so I was like, okay. <laughs> going to do something before it gets too hot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll talk. We'll talk. Yeah. All right. Good morning. Welcome to Declare Victory. This is JC. Did anyone else join? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. JC, it's Deborah Evans. Good morning. The evil car. Good morning, Deborah Evans. Good morning, Yvonne. And I think I heard someone else. Good morning, family. It's Sister Veronica. Hey, Sister Veronica, good morning. How's everybody doing? All good. Blessed by the Lord. Amen. Good, good. Good morning, it's Barbara. Good morning, Barbara. Good morning. Welcome to Declare Victory. This is JC. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Declare Victory. This is JC. Did anyone else join? Good morning. Welcome to Declare Victory. Good morning. This is Pretty Patrice. 
Good morning, Hi, Sam. Patrice. Good morning. Anyone Happy else? Tuesday. Happy Tuesday, sweetie. Good morning and welcome to Declare Victory. This is JC. Did anyone else join? Like to say good morning. Good morning. This is Barbara Adelodi. God bless you. Good morning. God bless you as well. Anyone else? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's Bernice. Good morning. Good morning, Bernice. Good morning, it's Marcella. Good morning, good morning. Good morning. Anyone else? Yes, hi, good morning, it's Paula, hi. Good morning, good morning. Good morning. Anyone else? Good morning, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Declare Victory. This is JC. Did anyone else join? Good morning. Welcome to Declare Victory. Good morning, good morning. Anyone else like to say hello or good morning? Renee, good morning. Good morning, good morning. Anyone else? Good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome to Declare Victory. This is JC. Okay, before we move forward, we ask you to mute your line so that we can proceed. Hello again, my name is JC and I am your hostess. Thank you for joining us here on Declare Victory. We are a prayer call that meets Monday through Saturday, starting at 6 o'clock a.m. Pacific Standard Time to edify, empower, encourage and equip you in your walk with Christ. Please feel free to invite a friend so they can be blessed too. Thank you for joining us daily in the excuse me. Thank you for joining us daily in March for the teachings on in, intentional growth, going higher, deeper, wider and stronger in your walk with the Lord. Be sure to join us in April as the new themes will be on both the mercy and grace of the Lord. You do not want to miss the teachings, lessons, and messages that the declares are preparing as they hear from the Lord for his people. We have one announcement today. Please join us tonight and every Tuesday night in March for TNT Bible Study with Pastor Mabel Jones right here on this call from 7 to 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Once again, please join us tonight and every Tuesday night in March for TNT Bible Study with Pastor Lavelle Jones right here on this call from 7 to 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. There are no uh, prayer requests from the app. The order of the call declaration will be by Brother Tony Sandoval. Praying and corporate praise will be done by Pretty Patrice. Then we will go right into closing comments hosted by the declare. Once again, the order of the call 
declaration will be by Brother Tony Sandoval. Praying and corporate praise will be done by Pretty Patrice. Then we will go right into the closing comments hosted by the declare. At this time, we ask you to put your phones on mute until instructed to come off mute. I now pass the call to declare for today. You guys have a blessed one. Morning, everybody. Good morning. This is Tony. Um, I just want to wake everybody up here. <laughs> so before we start, uh, let me just go ahead and pray before we kind of move into into today's message. Uh, Father, Lord, I just thank you so much, God, for this opportunity. Thank you so much for these people. Thank you so much for this line, God. I pray that you be here. I pray that you be the center of attention, God. I pray that your word is spoken loud and clear, God. I pray that I may not get in the way of your message, God. I pray that you clear me. Uh, of anything, God, that, that may get in the way of what you have to say today, God. I pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. You know, when I was, when I was younger, um, about middle school, I, I really fell in love with sports. Um, and something I started doing really young, uh, probably when I was about 10 years old or so. And when the sport I really liked playing, the sport I really loved playing, and got kind of obsessed playing, was basketball. So right around 10 years old, uh, my parents knew that I loved playing basketball. I played in middle school all throughout, and they got me a basketball court, uh, one of those like kind of affordable, foldable ones that you could kind of roll around and put sand at the base. Uh, we had it in the backyard, and I got a basketball, and I would go back there after school uh, and even before school sometimes, and I would just play. I would play for hours. I would, I would uh, you know, I played pick up in the park. I played during P.E., uh, I played on teams, I played on the street, I played everywhere. I would ride my bike to my friend's house so that we could go play. Like uh, That's all I did in middle school uh, was play basketball. And the thing about middle school is that everybody is about the same skill set in middle school. There's usually not a couple guys who are, you know, super better than the other person. Uh, they're all about the skill, same skill set. And when I got into high school, I was I was still playing. Um, I was still playing kind of, you know, in parks and in school and with friends. And, and, uh, and we, you know, we, we obviously played, like, in high school and everything like that. So, uh, again, everybody was about the same kind of skill set. But right around 14, uh, I started noticing that while other kids kept growing, um, I kind of stopped. <laughs> and then... I kind of topped out at about five foot six uh, and about 140 pounds at the time. I was a really skinny kid in high school. And there was uh, these other just massive giant kids who were, you know, six foot five. We had a, we had a guy on the team in senior year who was like six foot eight. Uh, so he was really big. <laughs> and so in basketball, being five foot six is a problem. Uh, in basketball, that's a really big problem. Uh, you know, I was not going to be physically greater than anyone on the court at any given time. You know, uh, there was a lot of players who I really kind of looked up to and kind of, you know, wanted to shape, you know, my particular skill set over. Uh, but when I looked at guys like Michael Jordan and Shaq and guys like Kevin Garnett, they were all, you know, physically gifted in ways that even most people in the NBA weren't. That made them great. I would never be six foot six like MJ and be able to, you know, jump from the free throw line. I would never be seven foot two and three hundred pounds and can move like a guard like Shaq. I would never be six foot eleven and have a wingspan of seven foot four like Kevin Garnett. So I remember really vividly uh I made the team probably just out of sheer determination uh in uh freshman year. Um but I was convinced that I was never gonna be really great and I don't think I could ever have been really good at all. Um, but I remember a player came, and he changed the definition of greatness. So it was a guy named Allen Iverson in the early 2000s. Uh, on paper, he was listed at about six feet tall uh, and at about 160 pounds. But anyone who ever saw him play, whether live or in person, knew this dude was not six feet tall. <laughs> he was probably closer to about 5'8", and he was probably closer to about he was about 160 pounds or so. He was a little guy. But but he dominated games. He scored almost at will. Nobody could stop him. He used his speed, his sleight of hand, and just sheer determination to be great. He redefined 
what it meant to be great. Before him, what it meant to be great that you needed to be a specific size, a specific skill set, uh, a specific physical stature to be great, but he redefined what it meant to be great. You know, this month's message has been th- is about going deeper, going wider, getting in with God. And I've been really thinking about going deeper as a quest for power, as a quest for greatness. And I've been thinking about where my power comes from, where our power as Christians come from. And I've also been really conscious of this idea of this inner tension within me, that God has created me in his image. God has created you in his image. So that means that I have some inner greatness, that you have some inner greatness within you. But the question then becomes, how do you become great without losing your own humility? How do you harness this inner power of Jesus and the Holy Spirit within you, reaching your potential, but not losing your humanity? I believe that everyone has an inner greatness, but how do you reach your inner greatness? Where do you start? Is greatness defined by how many people you are better than and how many people you stepped over to get to the top? As we get deeper with God, you start to realize how little your own greatness matters. Your own greatness changes. It's redefined. It becomes obsolete. You get weak. You make mistakes. You begin to realize that what really matters is God's greatness. And Jesus, he changed the definition of what it meant to be great. He changed the definition of greatness. Today's sermon is called The Power of Servanthood. Jesus redefined what it meant to be great with his wielding of his own power. We've probably all heard it, but there's this phrase that's really kind of thrown around in movies and TV and everything, that, that absolute power corrupts absolutely. I don't think that's true. I've actually never thought that was true. I think power only reveals who you really are. It doesn't change you. It unchains you. Sometimes we look humble, but it's only because we are afraid. But once you get a little bit of power, things change. Jesus had absolute power. Have you ever known someone who changed when they got a little bit of power? They get a little bit of power, a little bit of status, a little bit of authority, and then all of a sudden we're like, I don't even know who you are anymore. It's not that they changed. It's just you are being exposed to who they really are for the first time. I'm going to make a prediction that everybody within the sound of my voice, that you will become more powerful. At some point, at some time, as we get deeper with God, as we get stronger with God, as we delve deeper and just mature and just kind of grow and grow, I'm going to make a prediction that all of you will become more powerful, some incrementally and some exponentially. And the question becomes, what will you do with that power? So as I think about power, I think about greatness, getting deeper with God, I was kind of praying and just kind of let that in. And the way God kind of works within me is he drops me a word, he drops me a couple of things in my heart, and then I just think about it forever. <laughs> I pray about it, I read about it, I read up on it, and I kind of go through some things. And God kept guiding me on over to John 13. In John 13, chapter 1, is where we're going to be today. And this is a, this is sort of where it all goes down. It's sort of the tail end of Jesus' uh, mission here on earth, uh, his ministry here on earth. Uh, he's in the upper room with his disciples. Uh, they're about to have supper. Um, the Last Supper, this is right before Judas betrays him, right before Je- Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, right before uh, Jesus gets picked up by the Roman soldiers. He goes to Pontius Pilate, gets crucified, is buried, three days later, resurrected, and the story we win. But something happens in John 13, verse 1, that I think it's super indicative of Jesus' nature, of his power, of his greatness, of his redefinition of what it meant to be great. In these times, what it meant to be great was to be a warrior, was to be a person of status, was to be a person with money, was to be a person with wealth person with power. It sounds familiar. It's definitely something that kind of still, uh, it's still big 
in today's culture. If you got power, if you got money, if you got status, you're great. And Jesus, in his all-encompassing knowledge, knew that right before he was crucified, right before he left, he needed to teach his disciples one last thing. Maybe the greatest thing that he ever taught them. And he reserved this special lesson just for them about what it meant to be great, about what it meant to be powerful, about what it meant to do with your power. In 13 verse 1, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. He had loved his disciples during this time on earth, and now he loves him to the very end, is another translation. I love this insight into the motivation of Jesus. I love this insight because it shows Jesus' heart. He loved his disciples, even at the very end. He loved this, in, this entire time that he was with them, and he was loved them even now. Even as somebody who was in the room was going to betray them, he loved them. Jesus' entire motivation was based on love. Verse 2, during supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands. Um, I'm just going to take a quick pause. If you, if you can, please check your phone lines here. Just meet them uh, just so we can kind of preserve the call. We do record them, uh, and do just want to make sure that the call's kind of intact here. So, um, thank you. All right, we'll get back into verse 2. So, during supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, and Jesus, this is important, verse 3, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper, he laid aside his outer garment and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Just to kind of summarize a couple points here uh, from verses 1 through 3, 1 through 4, I should say. Jesus loved, Jesus knew about Judah, and Jesus had power. The context is very, very clear. Jesus did everything by love. What he was about to do was out of love. And Jesus knew, Jesus knew all things. It says that he was uh, from the Father, and he was going back to the Father. The Father, God in heaven, omnipresent, all-knowing. So he knew what Ju Judas was about to do, and Jesus had power. Jesus had power that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God. He had all power that the Father had given all things into his hand. So Jesus loved, Jesus knew, and Jesus had power. Those are three things that he had before he had, uh, before we continue into the next part. Um, he knew about Judas. He knew that this man that he walked with over the past three years, the man he ate with, broke bed with, the man who witnessed miracles, the man who he served and loved and cared about, he knew that this man, Judas, was going to betray him. And Jesus, having all this power, all this power, in verse 3 he says that he, all things were given to him. He knew everything. He had all this power. sat across from a dinner table, and Judas looked Judas in the eye and knew that this man was going to betray him. And if I had all power, and I had all knowledge, and everything was given to me, I can't imagine how I would react. I can't imagine what I would do knowing that in this room, in a small group of men who I loved, who I served, who loved me, who served me, that one of them was going to betray me. Not only betray me, but give me into debt. I can't imagine what I would do. You know, we always ask for power. God, give me power. Jesus, give me your power. Give me power. Give me power. Give me more of you, God. Give me more of your power. But what would you do with that power? It's a huge responsibility to have that power, to kind of wield that power. And I was kind of reading up on Judas, and I was reading different um, theories from theologians about why Judas did what he did. 
um, why he, um, you know, why he betrayed Jesus. And one of them that really kind of resonated and made a lot of sense with me was, um, was that Judas wasn't actually trying to kill Jesus. There are numerous times when the disciples re- react to Jesus' goodness and his compassion and his love with angst and confusion. And they ask things, and they're like, why do you react like this? We're, we're being occupied by the Roman, by the Roman, uh, by the Roman people, by the Roman Empire. Why do you react like this? So we're expecting their Messiah to react in violence. They're re- reacting, uh, they're wanting to, their, their, the reaction of their Messiah to be swift, to be military, to be, uh, to be conquering. And I think Judas wasn't trying to paint, wasn't trying to kill Jesus. Rather, he was trying to paint Jesus into a corner so that Jesus could finally wield his power, could finally react, could finally say, enough is enough. I'm going to take down the Roman Empire to meet violence with violence, to meet injustice with injustice. That's what Judas wanted. Judas thought that Jesus' power would come by violence, but Jesus was determined to use his power differently. Jesus was determined to use his power to serve. Jesus, in some ways, was handcuffed before this. He says in John 5.30 that he was powerless. Apart from the Father, I can do nothing. Jesus operated with not direct power, but relationship with the Father before this. But now Jesus had full power. He understood he was from God, and he was going back to the Father. Jesus had unlimited power now. He knew about Judas, but he loved, even still, even still. Verse 5, then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered, what am I doing? What, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but afterward, you would understand Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash your feet, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Back in the time they walked in sandals, and they had mud roads and dirt roads, and the main roads had animals all over them, donkeys and camels and sheep and goats. So the roads were covered in not only dirt, but dung and grossness. (laughs) <laughs> it was it was gross. So before when somebody walked into a house, it was ceremonial for them to have their feet washed so they could sit and eat cleanly. They sat at a table that was very, very low, so their feet were very evident and close to the table, so they had to get their feet washed before they did anything. And the washing of the feet was supposed to be the work of the lowliest servant. servant. It washed you clean and prepared you for the meal Jesus had full power here. I keep repeating it because it's so, it's so in contrast to what I would do if I had full power. You know, if I had what Jesus had at the time, if I knew what Jesus knew at the time, I would definitely not react. This would not be my first course of action to, to wipe the disciples' nasty feet. <laughs> That's not something I would do. But I think in kind of thinking about this and kind of going over this and, and asking God about this, I think we have a real misunderstanding about God. You go to God because you assume that he will share his power with us. But I believe that at his core, God is a servant. And I know that sounds sacrilegious. All of our worship songs sing about his power, about his greatness, about how much higher he is. But I think at his core, at his heart, His heart is to love, and love requires servanthood. God wants us to know his love more than he wants us to know his power. He wants us to allow him to serve us because it's the only way that we're ever going to get clean. It's the only way that we're ever going to get sanctified. It's the only thing that will work. I think it's easy for us to understand that God is greater than us, but I think it's incredibly difficult to understand that God is more humble than us. 
God knew that by creating us out of love, with free will, he would need to be a God who served us. God loves us unconditionally. And we don't even love God with conditions. The only one who can make you clean and forgive your sins is the God who is willing to come down and clean you. He's the only one who cares enough to lower himself to do so. Verse 10, Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but it is completely clean and you are clean, but not every one of you, for he knew who was to betray him. It was why he said, not all of you are clean. Jesus makes it clear that you, you are bathed, you are clean. Bathed is, is, um, is another word for being saved. If he saved you, you only need to do that once. But your feet, but your feet need to be washed every now and then. It's called sanctification. Sanctification is a constant process. Though you are saved, Though you are going to heaven, though you are gifted things like the Holy Spirit and direct contact with Jesus, sanctification is a constant process and it requires constant cleaning of your feet. You drag your feet through this life. You accumulate things. You get dirty. You pick up things. Sanctification is allowing God to humble his own greatness and allow him to wash your feet. Verse 12, when he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for I am. Verse 14, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one of the feet. Verse 15, for I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done. You, truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Jesus does not need our service or our love. We need Jesus' love and his service. As Jesus served, so should we. The power. We started talking about power in the beginning and what real power was. What would you do with real power when you got real power? Because as you get deeper and deeper with God, as you delve yourself deeper and deeper with God, you're going to start to receive power exponentially and incrementally, a little bit or a lot, long-lasting or for temporary. But you're going to start to get this power. And what are you going to do with that? Jesus at this time had full power. This was super Jesus. (laughs) This was super Jesus. This is the first time that it says that Jesus had his full potential. Before it was all relational. The things he did, the things that he he was able to do, feed the 5,000, walk on water, that was all relationship based, based on what he heard from the Father because apart from the Father, he could do nothing. This is the first time in the in in uh in John where it says that he had full power. He knew everything. He knew he came from the Father. He knew he was going back to the Father. He was revealed all things to him. And Jesus had full power. But the first thing that he does when he has full power and full revelation is he washes his disciples' feet, an act of pure, unadulterated, humble service. That's Jesus. That's Jesus at his core, a servant. And after this, Jesus never performed another miracle. He never performed another miracle. This is super Jesus. had his full capacity, had his full potential, and he never performed another miracle. But I think that his last and greatest miracle that defies all laws of nature and all the laws of the spiritual realm is that he allowed himself to be killed at the end of this. You know what that tells me? You know what that says to me? That true power, true greatness comes from service. It comes from the humbling of your own greatness, your own strength, your own skills and abilities because Jesus did it and a servant is not greater than his master. Jesus changed the definition of greatness. His greatness, his servanthood, 
was fueled entirely by his love for us. God uses his power not to conquer, but to love. He uses it to forgive you. He uses it to change the course of your life and your destiny. He will only use his power to set you free, to make you whole, to restore you. You want power? You want more of God? Serve. Serve. You want to get closer to God? Serve. You want to go deeper with God? Serve. You serve and you let Jesus serve you because it's the only way. I'm not sure if my purpose is to teach you something today. Maybe my purpose is to remind you. Remind you of what's important. Remind you that as you get deeper into knowing the Father's heart, you're surprised by his methods. That you're surprised at how little the Father cares about power, even in his vastness of power and his exponential use of his own power, of his boundless ability, about how little stock he takes into anything that isn't rooted in real love. I think my purpose today is to remind you all who go deeper, all who go wider, all who go stronger, that first you must serve with reckless abandon. And the more that you serve, and allow Jesus to serve you and wash your feet, the greater you will become. And now pass the call to the prayer warrior on the other side. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Good morning, Holy Spirit. We welcome you on this morning. Thank you for your word on this morning, oh God. We honor you, God. We glorify you, God. We humble ourselves before you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for waking us up this morning. Thank you for the breath of life. Thank you for the activity of our limbs. Thank you for us being in our right mind. Thank you that you watched over us last night. You let no hurt, harm, or danger come nigh to us or our dwelling places, oh God. We ask, O oh God, that you forgive us for our sins, that, that we are aware, and that, that we are not, O oh God. This is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. We thank you for Minister Tony on this morning, O oh God. Thank you for the reminder, O oh God, who we are in Christ Jesus. Thank you, O oh God, that you gave of your only begotten Son so that we might be saved. Thank you, God, that you took us out of the muck and the mire. You plucked us out, O oh God. You could have left us there to die in our sin, but you didn't. And for that, we say thank you, O oh God. Thank you, God, for being Humble God. Thank you, God, that when they hung you on the cross, and Lord Jesus, that you, you didn't say a mumbling word. They, they beat you and they beat you and they spit on you and they whipped you and they made you carry your cross and you said nothing. You could have called a legion of angels and you didn't. For us. So we say thank you. If we had 10,000 tongues, it wouldn't be enough to give your name the praise, the glory, and the honor that you so justly deserve. Oh, omnipotent Father, we honor you on this morning. Thank you, God. Thank you that you chose us, God. Thank you. You said some would be teachers, some would be preachers, some would be evangelists, oh God. But we, we must serve. We must be servant leaders unto you. We thank you for the privilege. We thank you for the honor. It is not enough, oh God. That we believe in our own will and our own mind, but we must submit ourselves unto you, Lord Jesus. 
So we thank you, God. We thank you. I don't know, God, where I would be, God. Where would we be if we had not surrendered to the will of the Holy Spirit? So, God, continue to fill us with your Holy Spirit, oh, God. Continue to let your light shine through us, oh, God, so others will know that Jesus Christ is Lord. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we pray for those that are sick in their bodies, sick in their minds. We know you to be a healer, so we will walk in our healing on this morning. I stand in the gap for those that didn't ask for a prayer request, and I ask, O oh God, that you cover us all with your blood, O oh God. Your blood that was shed on Calvary, oh God. We ask, oh God, that you surrender it all, God. Lay it all at your feet. We lay it all at your feet, Lord God. We thank you for this opportunity, God. I pray for those that are in the military that are sacrificing their lives so that we can be free to do and to serve. In the mighty name of Jesus, cover them, God. Bring them home safely, God. Cover their families that are praying for them, God. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah, Lord God. We pray for those that are in government, those that are making decisions over our lives. We pray, oh God, that they have a servant's heart when they make the decision that will change the activities and the decisions that are happening in the world, God. We pray for those that have lost lives, that have lost family members, in a plane crash, in a shooting, in a robbery, whatever. Those that have lost just because we pray for them and we pray that you comfort them as only you can, Lord Jesus. We pray for ministers and pastors and bishops, evangelists and ministers across the world that Take out time to pray for us. We thank you, God, for their sacrifice day after day after day. We pray for teachers that teach our children. Continue to watch over them, God. Our children, are they need us, oh God. So I pray, oh God, that there is someone that is feeding into their spirit who you are in the mighty name of Jesus. And we declare and decree we are the righteousness of God. Get your hands off our family. Get your hands off our children. Get your hands off our finances. You have no place here. You have no authority here. And the Lord Jesus rebukes you in the mighty name of Jesus. Oh, we glorify you, God. We humble ourselves before you, God. We thank you, God. We don't take it for granted that it wasn't the alarm clock that woke us, but it was you, God. You gave us the breath of life. You formed us from the dust of the ground and blew into our nostrils the breath of life. And then you Hello? took from man a rib and you made and created woman. And for that, we say thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. 
Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, great one. Oh, great one. We don't take it lightly. We love you. We honor you and you, we trust you with our lives. And we pray, oh God, that you will put into our spirit a willingness to serve, a willingness to submit, a willingness to surrender unto you so that we will receive power, the power of the Holy Ghost to give, to serve unto you, Lord God. So as we take our phones off of mute, we collectively will give your name the praise, the glory, and the honor. We thank you, God. Thank you for this day, this Tuesday morning, where we will glorify you and honor you, God. We thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for waking up this morning. Hallelujah, 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 Yes, Lord Jesus, hallelujah, Lord God. Jesus, hallelujah, Lord God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. We cry out to you this morning, Lord God. We lift up the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ this morning, Lord God. We say thank you, Lord God. Oh, hallelujah, Lord God. For that example, Lord God, of oh, Jesus, hallelujah, Lord God. How you humble yourself, Lord God, to wash out of the blood of Lord God. How you humble yourself, Lord God, to wash your Lord, thank you, Lord God. Oh, thank you, Lord God. For that example, Lord God. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord God. Now we are. Oh, hallelujah, Lord God. Humble ourselves, Lord God. Oh, thank you, Lord God. Thank you for the heart of a servant, Lord God. Oh, thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God, that we shall receive power, Lord God. Oh, hallelujah, Lord God. The power, Lord God. Thank you for the Oh, Jesus, hallelujah, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God, for reminding us all that we have no grace for, Lord God. Oh, hallelujah, Lord God. So much to be grateful for, Lord God. Oh, hallelujah, Lord. Victory in that praise. Victory in that praise. We declare. We thank you, Lord God. For every healing, Lord God. We say thank you, Lord God. For every breakthrough, Lord God. We say thank you, Lord God. For every deliverance, Lord God. Oh, hallelujah, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, Lord In the name of Jesus, hallelujah, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God. Those, Lord God, that's got to go deeper, Lord God. 
encourage them, Lord God. We pray for them. Oh, hallelujah, Lord God. Those that are seeking, Lord God. Those that are seeking, Lord God. Help us to trust in you, Lord God. Help us, Lord God, to stand on your holy word, Lord God. Help us, Lord God, to submit unto you, Lord God. Again, if you guys have any questions or any comments or anything, 
Good morning. Good morning, Beth. Hey, uh, this is Brother Eric. Uh, that declaration was right on. Um, that's what it's all about, really. That's what it's all about. Now, I, I, I was um, born and raised uh, um, Pentecostal. And uh, in the black church, we tend to ven- venerate. And I, I, I can't say for Baptists uh, uh, or AME, Zion, or, 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 or any other de- various denominations, uh, but I can say for the, in the sanctified church, a lot of times we tend to venerate our past. We tend to kind of lift them up uh, um, and, and, kind of tr- and, and kind of place on pedestals. We identify our churches by our pastor. This is, you know, this is my pastor. But you're, yeah. and I really didn't see the the. I really didn't see until I was uh, an elder in the Presbyterian Church that really that process of, of servanthood in terms of, of of leadership, in terms of uh, of, of of pastorship, and because the the power structure is based differently. Um, I grew up, you know, we respected to serve our church, but we respected to serve our church and our pastor. You know, and it was always this this mindset of you know doing this, but but uh, your your declaration really said it all, and and Christ was the example. You know, saying Christ didn't have a home. You know, Christ stayed at other people's place. Christ was always at at everyone's beck and call. And you always see uh, uh, Christ always uh, 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 reaching out, always healing, always doing this thing, always going here and going here. And this is the creator of the universe. And so it was an excellent example of, 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 of Christ's servant. And, and ultimately, you know, his ultimate act of service was to die for us and not just die, but, but, but the way that he died in, 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 in the most excruciating and the most humiliating way that, that you could at that time. And it's always, it's always been a, an example. It's a powerful declaration that if I can get out of my own way and understand that, yes, there is power because there's a power in serving that, that really keeps us from, from, from being um, isolated there's a power of serving that keeps us humble. There's a power of serving that keeps us really connected to God because that's what God does. And that's what God continues to do is serve and minister to us every day. And so I just want to thank you for that, for that wonderful uh, declaration. And it's something that, uh, that I will think about today. It's something that I was always raised up to be so it's it's an integral part of me, but it's always great to have that reminder that it's not about us, it's not about yeah. our ministry, you know, it's not about anything that my name's attached to. It's an understanding that uh my title does not define me, but how I treat people and how I serve people, that's what re- ultimately defines us because that's what ultimately defines us. That's why it's so great to serve a God who ultimately serves us every day. So thank you very much, my my brother, and God bless. Thanks, bro. Appreciate it, man. Yeah, I think that was just the biggest thing. I mean, I was kind of just meditating on this and just like I'm never um, – I'm always shocked, I should say, by the methods that Jesus uses um, to get his point across. You know, washing people's feet is is something that's, you know, super looked down on but also just knowing the kind of power he had and that he still chose to do that. And that he tells Peter, like, this is the only way. This is the only way this is going to work. If you want a relationship with me, you got to be clean. And the only one who can clean you is me. You know, Jesus at his heart was a servant. God at his heart is a servant. And just to kind of reposition that and know that, you yourself have got to be a servant. I mean, it, it changes the game when that kind of clicks inside of you. Thank you, man. Um, anyone else on the line have any questions, any comments about today? Amen, amen. Hello? Hello? 
Hey, how you doing? I want to jump in real quick before I have to get Yvonne ready. But with, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. And that was a uh, – I got a lot out of this declaration, Tony. It was, it was just had me just stuck just thinking, you know. But the thing most of all that stuck out to me was the serving. And and well, let, me, let me tell you just a quick little a situation that happened years ago at, at my church. Mm-hmm. I remember, remember our pastor – had did the um, gifts, gifts like um, where you figure out what your gift is, like like a question thing. And I remember my couple of saying when I, when you did the numbers and you add it up and tell you what what your gift was, it was something like that, right? I know it's mm-hmm. something crazy, but yeah. Anyway, mine <laughs> was a couple of things serving, right? But it was early in my walk, and in my mind, I was like, because oh. I was looking at all the other gifts, I was like, I don't want to serve me. I don't <laughs> want to this is a right? <laughs> I was like, no, that's not me, you know, I was like, no, right? But God is so good because it so is. <laughs> Over yeah. the years, I really doubt that I've looked back, at, you know, and everything. I love to serve. I really do. Yeah. I think that's when I'm more happy. I, I'm more happy when I'm serving. I, I feel more joy when I'm serving, you know. But I remember yeah. a long time ago when I was reading that, I was like, I want to, it was a bad rhythm. It was like a lot of them, right? And I remember I was looking like, why well, I get to get serving? Like, that yeah. ain't special. But it's so special. And I love how you put it and how you, you gave it to us because you really were just really were showing how special serving is and how God serves. And it just I just wanted to jump in there real quick because I know I got a kid already. But it was just so, I, I really thank you. And that's, it was just so on point. And God is so good. And I love you guys. I appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> We love you too. <laughs> All right, thank you, sister. Um, yeah, if you know, it kind of it reminds me a lot of when I came back to church and like I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> I was a kid off the street, so I didn't I didn't really know what to do at church. Church seemed so foreign, so I just served. I just did anything, man. I vacuumed carpets. I set up chairs. I put up projectors. I did powerpoints. I mean, I did whatever they needed me to do. And the more that I served, the more I found the heart of God. And the more that I found the heart of God, the more I realized that I had to serve. Um, so the two go hand in hand. Thank you. Um, a- anyone else here on the line have any questions, any comments? This is Dee Dee. Good morning. Um, Good morning, Dee Dee. Thank you. Thank you so much. And me being the basketball mom, my son, is, <laughs> well, he'll be 30 in um, June, but he's been playing mm-hmm. ball since he was born, actually. And then I have two nephews and Everybody that knows knows I love the game. I don't really have a mm-hmm. team, but I have favorite players. Right now it's Brian, but I've been a Shaq fan. I've mm-hmm. been Allen Iverson. When you talked about him, I got tears because I've always been a fan of him. And basically yeah. what you said is true. He changed the game basically because he didn't fit the criteria. You know what I mean? 5'11", a 5'10", but they they would always list him as being six feet. And to actually see him in person and just yeah. to follow his career and – And then again, like I said, having a son, and I know the sacrifice that it takes, you know, living in Richmond and driving my son from all over, I mean, from vet to Santa Clara to Reading to Eureka, just all these games and and just what it took. And then it reminded me of uh, even when I was um, young, I've always been um, into dance. I took tap. My mother put me in everything because I was a little kind of – I won't say I was busy a little bit, but I, I kind of stayed in trouble, so she had to keep me, you know what I mean, because yeah. I would talk and I'd get in trouble in class. I don't know, y'all. Y'all know I'm really shy. Yeah. But when I found that I loved cheerleading, um, being this height, I was born 5'8". I was born with hips, so I didn't fit that look. You know what I mean? Back in the day, cheerleaders mm-hmm. had to be blonde, skinny, scrawny, all that. But when I really um, caught on to what it takes to really just be the best, that I could be, you know what I mean? It didn't matter that I wasn't, I didn't fit what, 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 what the world said, if that makes any sense. But what I got yeah. out of it, too, is when you really know who you are, really know, you know what I mean, and not be like, like and, and it goes back to when you talked about Alan Iverson, if I had really just shrunk and said, okay, I don't look like <laughs> what these people want me to look like, I'm t- too tall, too hippie, too dark, whatever, I would have crumbled and I wouldn't have grown, and even it ties into how we got to grow in our um in our faith and our and how even with with being in um in 
church and you know sometimes for me I was one who would compare myself to how other people pray and and spoke and you know if you went to theology school and know how to to exergy and know how to pronounce words and stuff I would be quiet mm-hmm. I wouldn't be bold you know what I mean so I'm just grateful yeah. that I really tapped into when we really think about it and I'm probably going all around the mobile but when you really know that God truly created us all uniquely and wonderfully and fearfully made to stand out and to grow. When you really t- get that point, then, man, there's nothing that you can't do, leaps and bounds. And and we can just grow in this thing. And it, and it all ties into life and everything that you said this morning. Um, and to be a servant and to really understand where, where your positions are. I'm a greeter. I'm one of the – I'm well, I have a team at my church. And – um. I was telling him on Sunday, you know, I've I've always wanted to sing. Well, I didn't get that gift, but I can sing. And I want to sing Usher. <laughs> me too. But my church tells me that I don't really have a temperament for Usher. I, I guess I'm a little bit too aggressive anyway. But I'm on the front door. So I'm the first mm-hmm. line. I'm the front line. And I love greeting people. And I know that you can tell when people are coming in. You can kind of, you know what I'm saying? I, God gave me this. I can kind of look at some person, a person and tell, you know, people come to church with all kind of stuff. So I know now that that's where I've grown. And I've been at my church since 96, and I've been in the greeter ministry so long that it's just like second nature. So I just thank you. I know I said a whole bunch of whatever I'm saying, but hopefully somebody got something out of this. <laughs> but I'm sharing, but your your declaration was amazing. I just I just love how we've changed on this call that we have topics and that we go and every declarer brings something unique to it. You know what I mean? So you can get bits mm-hmm. and pieces out of it. So I'm just grateful for you, man of God. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I, I always love that God uses the super unqualified people and that he maximizes their potential. Guys like Moses and Abraham and Peter, guys who seemingly are super unqualified, he maximizes their potential because it's not about us becoming great, but uh, uh, but us serving so that God can make us great. Um, and I think that's super important. I really appreciate that. Um, anyone else have any questions or any comments? Hi, Tony. Good morning. It's Moni. Hey, Moni. Hi. Um, great message. I really like the way you laid it out for us. Um, there's just, you know, there's so many blessings with um, with serving. And, um, you know, um, it allows us to discover our spiritual gifts and um, it allows us to experience miracles mm-hmm. and it allows us to experience the joy and peace that comes from from being obedient. And this is not just serving in the four walls of the church, you know, just doing kingdom work. Um, mm-hmm. It could be something as simple as picking up the phone and encouraging your brother, you know, um, pouring into him, sending a text message to somebody you know, to empower and edify them. Um, Serving helps us to just be more like Jesus. You know, it really does. And it surrounds us with Christians who can help us follow Jesus. And it also increases our faith. You get blessed when you serve, when you do something for the Lord, when you really seek the Lord's voice and do something for Him, you get blessed by it. And most people, <clears throat> they're just, they make themselves too busy to be able to to um, serve the Lord and humble themselves and serve the Lord. And, and if they just take a chance on him and step out and serve and, and, and humble yourself and edify someone else, there really truly is blessings in that. And I think that goes missed. It goes missed sometimes. And, um, you know, it it really allows us to experience God's presence in so many ways. It's just so good for our soul. But I really like what you brought to us today. Um, It really puts emphasis and importance on what God wants us to really be doing. 
just redirect redirect our um, our uh, path. What, what, what are we supposed to be doing? And what are we supposed to be doing on the daily? We should never be found bored. Well, I'm bored. You know, I'm just I have nothing to do. That's not what God wants. You know, God wants us to go out there and and further His kingdom and grow His kingdom. And step out and serve not only in the church but even outside the church. And if we don't yes. know where and what to do, He will definitely meet us if we drop to our knees and just try to hear His voice. Because every one of us should be able to hear His voice, so that He could guide us where are we supposed to be, whose feet are we supposed to be washing, how are we supposed to be doing this, so that we can turn around and be blessed. And it really does take the focus off of what we're going on what we're going through, I mean, it really does take the focus off of it and it helps us to get through it quicker because that's the goal is to get through what we're going through quick, learn from it and move on. In any case, um, thank you so much for your message. I always love listening to you and I thank God for you. Thank you. Thanks, Moni. Um, I, I really, really love what you said. Uh, it, it should never be bored. <laughs> you know, the Bible says that the the work is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Like, there's, there's a lot to do. Like, you should never feel like there's nothing for you to do. Or that you should never feel like there's nothing for you to do that you can do. There's plenty to do, and there's plenty that you're supposed to do. God has built, you know, things within us that are going to be so natural when we do serve that they just make sense. Uh, it just makes sense, and it's easy. Like, anytime I'm asked to speak, or ask the preacher somewhere, like, it's never worked for me. <laughs> it, it's like, I love doing it. I know, Moni, when you text me before, like, um, hey, are you ready? And I always say, I'm ready. Like, I've, I've been ready. I'm good to go. <laughs> like, I take a lot of, you know, stock in knowing that, like, this is fun for me. I love doing this. I love hearing from God. God is always speaking, and you just got to be listening. And, you know, I... I, there's a lot of preaching that I do to myself <laughs> that God is speaking. And there's a lot of things that God is doing within you and out of you and at all times. And I just really believe that God always has a place for you and God always has a position for you and God always has a place for you to serve. Uh, you just got to work at it. You just got to discover it. So I, I appreciate what you said. Hmm. Anyone else on the line have any questions, any comments? Any other questions, any comments here? Okay. If we don't have any questions, if we don't have any comments here, I can go ahead and close the line. I'm just going to a, I'm just gonna pray for you guys so you guys can start your day right again. But, uh, Lord, I just thank you so much for everybody who can hear me right now, God. I thank you so much for these people, these men of God, these women of God, these powerful servants for you, God. I pray, Lord, that they may find their place, they may find their pedestal, they may find their podium or where they're supposed to speak and teach and serve God. These are powerful women and men of God. These are powerful people, God, and they will grow. You told me they were going to grow, that they're going to grow exponentially, that they're going to grow incrementally, that they, but they are going to grow, that they will develop power, that they will be receiving a new blessing of power. That's what you told me, God. And you said, what are we going to do with that power, God? Well, you said loud and clear, serve. With whatever power I give you, serve. Serve first. And I just pray, Lord, that these people may be a serving people, God. That these people may be a servant heart people, Father Lord. That they may want to serve you and serve God's people and get plugged in and do the work, Father Lord. And I thank you for today, God. I pray that we attack the day, that we seize the day, Lord, that we make the best of today, God. I pray that we keep our hearts, ears, and minds open, God, because you are always speaking, God. I pray for traveling mercies as we go to work. I pray that you bless us. I pray that we get along with our coworkers and our bosses, God. I pray for peace that, are, that just goes beyond any understanding, God. And I pray all these things in the name of Jesus. All right. Love you guys. Have a great day. Love you. Bless. Thank you, Tony. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you all. Have a blessed day.
I can't wait to go to war. Thank you. Love you, Miss Yvonne. Have a good day at work. Thank Have a good day, everyone.
Come on, 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 come on,